Um, thanks for stopping by. This is going to be the uh, first round table of the week. Um, topic for discussion today is wearables. I'm going to bring up the uh, panelists first of all, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the marketplace. Um, so our first guest is Joan Vertis. Joan is the CTO from Moltec, which is our wholly owned subsidiary of Flextronics, very much seen as the wearables guys. So Joan, come and join me. Uh, my next guest is Tom Foley. Tom is from ASM. Um, come, and, come and join us, Tom. Tom covers more of the placement side, and our next guest, Jeff Shake, covers the print side for ASM. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, I was at CES at the beginning of January, and again at a wearables technology event in Munich a couple of weeks later, and wearables really does seem to be getting a lot of buzz in the market. It's been doing that for a while, but a lot of people feel that 2015 is, is really the year for wearables. Um, for me, it kind of goes into a couple of categories. There are a few things that are electronic, consumer electronic devices that we wear on our bodies or on wrist straps that have pretty much the standard challenges. But there are a lot of products that bring new challenges to the market, and that's really what we want to explore here today. I want to start by setting the scene and trying to understand what are the key challenges from the wearables market and where that's going to take us in terms of how we assemble those, how we build those, and the kind of demands it's going to make on the equipment we use to that. I'm going to start with Joan, uh, who has a huge amount of experience in this area, running the uh, Interconnect Technology Center, Chief Technology Officer for Moltec, and making a lot of these wearables. Tell me where you see the key, the key challenges in the marketplace. So one of the things that on. One of the things that we've seen is more on the miniaturization standpoint, and uh, I have a few things on my, my wrist that uh, kind of highlight some of the things you've probably seen when you've gone through the stores. But what's really been interesting to us, it's it now goes around your wrist, it now goes on the body, and for us, they want the same functionality that you have in your cell phone now in something that's wearable. And so it makes it very much a challenge for us to figure out how are we going to do this from a design standpoint, from the material selection, from the power that you're going to use, and then all the equipment that has to be in the background putting all these things together so you can get something like this and you can put it on your wrist and you can see how it's, you know, your health might be um, advancing with, with time. Okay, so we're seeing miniaturization, there's a mixture of heterogeneous devices, but flexibility is a big part of it. Flexibility is a huge part of this. Um, one of the things that's been interesting, I always have samples with me, and uh, one of the things that's been really interesting for us, this is a uh, rigid flex. I know this is a camera, but you guys can always come and see this afterwards. This is a rigid flex system. Um, flexible has really been key in promoting uh, the wearable market because now not only do you get something that's flat that you normally see when you do the processing, but this whole thing now has to go around inside this wearable in order to work. And, you know, in the past, when we had these type of things when they were just flat, we didn't have to worry about a lot of movement. But now I have to look at, we have to look at how these things move and twist and make sure that we can have all the materials to be robust around this, as well as the assembly process of this, because once you start moving it, you have different components on here and you can easily pop them off. So there's a lot of things that we have to do when we do designs and we work on the the manufacturability of this so it has the longevity in the market. Yeah. And Tom, from your point of view, I'll come to you in a minute, Jeff. From mm -hmm. your point of view, what are you seeing in the marketplace? What what demands are people making making on you from, from the wearables market? From the wearables market, uh, from a placement machine standpoint, it's uh, very very much along the lines of what Joan has just mentioned. Uh, high density, uh, small component placement. It's something that we've been doing now for quite some time with the with you know, smartphone manufacturing, but it, now the form factor gets even smaller in some cases with watches, smart watches, the uh, uh, fitness bands that Joan is showing as well. So you really um, have to, you know, when these uh, factories get smaller and smaller, you got to really build it right the first time. The, some of these components are so small that they're they're not even reworkable. Yeah. So you got to build the you know build it, set the process up so it builds it all right the first time so that's yeah, yeah. so that, that reliability is 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 key as well we don't just want a product that, that has that functionality it's got to be reliable what are you seeing out there when when you're talking to people what are they challenging you in terms of 
the print process. Well, it's a, it's a very good example that you, you, you show us, a good illustration of, of the challenge there because it's so flexible and flimsy. Um, that wouldn't be the format that you're introducing then to the printer. It's going to be ganged up in some sort of a more rigid panel, but you do see that it's very flexible. And probably even in that panelized format, it's going to be flexible. Yeah. And in the printer, it absolutely, absolutely has to be flat. It has to be stationary. Yeah. If there's any sort of deviation in any axis, X, Y, Z, in the print process, uh, you're going to have a, a defective print result. So yeah. we've got to keep that absolutely as rigid of a structure as possible, which is exactly the opposite of you know, what it is in its final form on your wrist, say, in that instance. So we got to make sure that it's fixtured properly in the machine so that it stays absolutely stationary in the print cycle. And uh, we have uh, fixturing tools to, uh, to assist us yeah. to achieve that. Yeah. Now, um, we have to smartly design the stencil, obviously. You don't want to overprint those pads because those p you're using every bit of the real estate yeah. in that, those little coupons. And uh, you go outside of the boundaries there and you're not going to gasp at the stencil aperture. So you probably want to undersize your apertures a little bit with respect to the pad. Yeah. That will have a detrimental effect on your area ratio. So you're not going to get the paste out of those yeah. apertures. And we have a very neat solution for that from a printing, uh, <coughs> one of our products being the proactive squeegee, which is okay. uh, it's an ultrasonically powered squeegee blade. And that's going to help get the paste in and out of those very yeah. small apertures, uh, low area ratio challenges. So. Okay. Uh, give you a little perspective on yeah. it. So what, what I'm kind of curious about, guys, is you've both been seen very much as technology leaders in these, in these particular marketplaces yourself. What do you think you've been able to add as a benefit of, of actually being able to come together? Is this a technology where you've been able to leverage the relationship between DEC and C-Place and, and actually offer a more integrated solution? Because I know if we look around some of the facilities we've seen, that's the solution I've seen being used. Jeff, Tom, do you want to? Yeah, I, I can uh, I can address that. Um, yeah, when when we look at uh, controlling the complete, let's say the line process, um, screen printing was was fundamentally the next thing that we we needed in our, our you know in our line in order to control the process. We're we're now we're moving forward with uh, looking at uh, the ability to provide some closed loop <laughs> feedback um, from the from the you know printer to the to the placement process. Um, you know, you're all already able to control things like stencil offset and uh, based on what the SBI is seeing and uh, uh, cleaning the stencil, uh, you know, how often that, that gets done as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it just uh, uh, opens up a lot of opportunities for, for as these part, you know, components and, and, and assemblies, especially in uh, wearables, get smaller and smaller. To be able to control the process dynamically is really very, very important, and we're going to see more and more of that going forward in the future. Yeah, so. and that's happening in a whole bunch of industries. Yeah. What I was interested in, Joan, is when we look at the wearables sector, it feels like it's a, a collision of electronics and it's a collision of apparel, and now it's even a collision of fashion as well. Is there anything that we as the electronics manufacturers can learn from those other industries in, in how to not just how to build stuff, but how to fulfill it out into the marketplace. I like the fact that it's going to fashion, um, for sure. Uh, but I think one of the key things that at both sides are going to learn. Um, when you look at what we're trying to do with a, a wearable device, electronic device, uh, anybody that's been working in electronics for a long time, you, uh, you really can't throw this in water. Um, it always has <coughs> some sort of moisture challenges once in a while. But now when you get this in apparel, People like to wear their clothes, and they maybe are running in those clothes, and you certainly want them to uh, take a shower and clean those clothes. So, you know, how do we balance out the electronic side with the apparel side? And I think um, some of the things that we're also seeing is when you start getting into the apparel to the to point we were making uh, before, is that normally we're used to handling something that's fairly flat, and we do the assembly uh, attach on this. But now you're starting to get into the fabrics, and these fabrics, you have to look at the fabric itself and the weave of the fabric, and how do you put down the, the line that you want for the electronics, how do you encase it. Um, and then once you have this fabric, how do you bring it together into a shirt? And looking at even buttons as a potential interconnect to have it talk to bring your shirt together and have a full continuous loop of electronics. Yeah. So there's a, a lot of balancing that has to happen 
in the apparel market uh, with the electronics. We're both um, learning from this. Yeah. There's a lot of activity in this area, which I find very exciting because it brings it to a different media that we hadn't had a deal yeah. before. Yeah. You know, and I'm a technology geek kid, so I like doing those kind of things. But yeah, yeah certainly that's going to be a, a fascinating area going yeah. forward. And certainly those processes are going to challenge you guys as well. One of the things I wanted you to do, Joan, was just kind of think about the ideal scenario from, a, from an equipment supplier's point of view. What do you, when you're looking into a new technology, what are, you, what are you asking your equipment suppliers to do in terms of getting involved in this process? And, and what can they bring to the party to make sure you can enable the product for your customers? I think one of the key things, um, I've been in this market for a while, um, I think one of the key successes has been in the semiconductor market as well as in the printed circuit market where we do road mapping. And in road mapping, you know, we kind of see the, we anticipate what the future can be. And what that does is it basically trickles down. I know this is going to be on my wrist. What do I need to worry about? How do I need to move this? And then, you know, what are the pitches going to be? What kind of components am I going to have? What's the height going to be? And so we can get on top of that from understanding through road mapping to kind of put the vision of this is what I need and then I can go to the equipment yeah. side and say this is what I'm thinking and then their collective intelligence says well this is how we translate it into yeah. our equipment and road mapping I think is going to be very key in the wearable market having the success that it's yeah. going to need yeah. because there's a lot of things out there but you know if you look at the overall vision of it um, you need to know where it's going to go because you we, we can currently leverage what we've been learning in the like the cell phone market where things were getting miniaturized <laughs> But now you have to look at even how do you, um, how do you power this? And you can't, uh, it, that power connection is really key. Mm. Um, and also do you, recharging, recharging in, in place. Uh, you have the topology challenges. So there's a lot of things that I think if you just look as the, what we want to do in the wearables going forward um, and road mapping out what are the key features and then working very closely with the equipment side yeah. of the business, we can really get an advance of this like yeah. we want to do yeah. um, going forward. Yeah, and we need to be really agile and really fast on that, I guess. And from your point of view, Jeff, if you look at that, uh, to respond to that, what do you do as an organization to engage in those roadmaps? How do you, how do you get involved in those roadmaps and make sure that you've got the product that is going to resolve that challenge? Well, we start right here in this forum. So hopefully the message gets out to everybody that you know we're here as ASM, Printing placement together, yeah. and uh, so yeah, the message starts. Here. <coughs> Obviously, um, strategically, we position ourselves to uh, go to the market, uh, present technical conferences, educate ourselves mm -hmm. by connecting with people that are already doing that. So um, you know, we are behind, working behind the scenes, and we're also publicly visible in forums such as this, trying to get yeah. the message out. Yeah, and Tom, you have technology scouts out in the marketplace that are looking at new technologies and. And sometimes it's going to be disruptive. It's going to be a groundbreaking technology that you have to try to resolve these issues. Yeah, that's right, uh, Phil. Um, as far as road mapping goes and, and, and finding out what our customers' needs are, um, we, we, uh, we involve our customers in our road map discussions. We get a lot of our ideas for product features and capabilities from, from these discussions we have with our, with our you know, core customers. Um, take, for example, the, uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier, the, when you're placing small parts, it's, it's critical from the, from the pick all the way to the placement to be able to know exactly where this component is at all times. Some of the um, functionality we got out of our machines came from roadmap discussions with customers like being able to pick a component without actually having the nozzle physically touch the component in the tape pocket. The nozzle for 0201s, 0105, 03015, nozzle has to stop prior to the surface of the component, switch vacuum on, and you get a much better yeah. reliability as far as the pick reliability goes. Um, absence, sen uh, absence or presence sensors on the heads themselves. The nozzle with some of these parts, is, the vacuum flow is so minimal that yeah. you can't measure it. So you, the only way to know really if the part's been picked and it, and it or not is that the uh, nozzle passes through a laser um, absence presence sensor and that process is repeated at the placement so you know all of these uh, features we've been we have actually developed over a number of years and they just basically um, 
fold right into what's necessary, in many cases anyways, what's necessary for the wearables market yeah. as well. So, yeah. Yeah. so it's a two-way communication, isn't it? It's, it's really you sharing with these guys what you think your customers are going to be wanting and these guys sharing some of the technologies that are going to enable you to maybe deliver that in a different way or come up with different solutions. Um, the, the couple of events I've been to recently in the wearables arena, I've been totally blown away by the diversity of products that people are bringing to the market in, the, in, in, in wearables. So many different solutions. I just want to ask you all individually, and this is more as a consumer than as an as a expert, what do you think are the technologies that are, are going to become part of our everyday lives? What do you think is going to make its way through? Maybe we can start with you, Jane. Well, I mean, for me, I, I see that there's going to be a blend between probably the fashion and the, and the wearable electronics. Uh -huh. I think that's going to be some place that I hope gets accelerated a little bit more. Um, but from an enabling technology, I think power is going to be one of the biggest challenges. How do we power this and then recharge? Um, that is definitely uh, uh, going to be a challenging area, and I see a lot of activity going on in that space, which I, I, I'm very encouraged cool. about. And then the, um, the other side is I'm not really much into the fashion and the clothing <coughs> as is, you know, like I said, in the jewelry side. Okay. And um, using the, the phone is your hub, let's face it. A phone is a hub now. And so anything that you're wearing is going to attach to that phone. And for me, it's that constant connection and how do I get that information back to myself in a, in a way I can use it. Yeah. And I think those are probably the two key things that I see from an enabling point that are going to have to happen. But anybody out there doing wearables, make it look good. You have, yeah. a, you have somebody that'll buy it. But uh, Yeah, I think I that's see. an important part of the market. And what you mentioned about data is important. That plays into yeah. that whole internet of things debate and the intelligence of right. things, all those kind of things. Yep. Tom, what wearable are you going to buy? Well, that's a good question. I, uh, I enjoy golf, so one thing that comes to mind is that these uh, fitness bands, you know, have some technology, work with software, where when you take a s swing, you know, that it actually can measure your velocity and your swing arc and can be a kind of a, a learning tool that you can use rather than paying a lot of money, you know, having to go to a... Uh, you know, a, uh, You're going to you put know, your golf coach out a of tour. work? What, sir? You're going to put your golf coach out of work? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, no, I'm, I, 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 need, I need more work, I think, than just a fitness kind of band could give me. But there's other things. Uh, you know, I had some uh, sleep-related issues for a while and uh, apnea-related. And, and I know now their medical uh, side of things, they're coming out with um, devices that you can actually lay across your mattress. Mm -hmm. It measures your, um, your body position, um, you can, your, your, your breathing cadence, your regular... And all of this can be then wirelessly um, hooked into the uh, sleep clinic, yeah. so you can you can kind of see where sleep sleep clinics are very expensive. They got limited beds and that sort of thing. If you can do this at home and they can just look at the data, doctors can look at the data there and then analyze. Then you get more nights of data as well. You could just three or four nights in a row rather than one night in a sleep clinic. Yeah. They're trying to capture the essence of what your problem is. It's very difficult in in one night. So. That's another thing I think that yeah. you'll see in the future as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Jeff, what about you? Yeah, so the fashion part of it really doesn't appeal too much to me personally. So I'm more of a functional, you know, it's, it's got to be cool. It's got to work. <laughs> got to do something. Give me some value. Appearance, not so much. Um, I'm thinking of it from the standpoint of uh, coaching kids in their sports and what types of things can you do to help them improve. I mean, we know that youth sports is com extremely competitive these yeah. days. They need to start earlier and earlier, and, and, and I'm probably behind the ball with my six-year-old boy. He's, you know, he's not involved in some of these things yet, and I'm pro probably, you know, too late, but maybe with the help of some wearables, you yeah. know, then we can develop tech better techniques more quickly. Yeah. Um, and me not being, you know, the best of coaches, uh, you know, maybe those devices can help me, uh, you know, yeah. really achieve some success there. So I, I see that, you know, as a coach, yeah. you can be, you could find some unique aspect of using a wearable to improve yeah. the. Yeah, I think game. that sports coaching is really interesting. And one of the things that um, I read a few pieces on recently was the German team, the German football team, soccer team, as they would call it here, uh, that won the World Cup, were using wearable devices in their coaching to track the, um, the distances that people were running and, 
and to make decisions about when they were making substitutions. So yeah. we're seeing that stuff play more and more an active role in our lives. Doubtless we're going to see wearables everywhere. It's an exciting growing market. Um, great to see everybody being being involved in that market and actually leveraging the the integration of, of deck and C place to be able to take a much more holistic approach and support Joan and the efforts that companies like Flextronics are making in that area. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for taking part today. Thank you everybody for listening. Um, and we'll see you next time. 3.30, we're gonna be talking about the manufacturing industry in Mexico. Thanks for stopping by.